Well, grab your Bible. We're going to dive into a message here today. We're actually launching into a new series today. And if you're new to World Harvest Church, you get the notes when you come in, the paper notes if you like that way. We actually have them online digitally on the church app or on the YouVersion Bible app. YouVersion Bible app, those are a little more extensive than the, the church app ones are. You can go to the YouVersion Bible app, hit events, and you can pull them up that way. But we're going to dive in to a series here for the next couple of weeks called Living a Blessed Life. Living a blessed life. If you would, turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28 here, as we dive in with the time that we've got remaining here today. If I was to ask you this question, how many of you want to live a life that is cursed? <laughs> how many of you are like, sign me up for that? Woohoo! None of us would, amen? But if I was to ask you, how many of y'all want to live a blessed life? Probably everyone are like, woo, yeah. And so sometimes, you know, in our church life, people are like, oh, you know, you're talking about blessings. Does God really want you to be blessed? Well, let's answer that question. And my favorite place to answer that question is, does God want us living a blessed life? I find in Deuteronomy, way back Old Testament, in chapter 28. Let's look at a couple of these verses here, starting in chapter 28. I'm reading this out of the New King James Bible here. Verse 1 says this, now it shall come to pass that if you diligently obey, diligently what? Obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully how many of his commandments? Oh, come on, look at your name and say all, all his commandments, which I command you today that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Verse two, and all these blessings shall come up on you. And look at this, and overtake you because you, Why? Obey the voice of the Lord your God. Verse three, blessed shall you be in the city. Come on, man, I like that. Come on, blessed shall you be in Enid, Oklahoma, or whatever your town is. Blessed you shall be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Well, come on, where's all my country folks today? And you're proud of the country folks. Woo! Man, I tell you what, Tony Fisher, the Lord just laid on my heart. That's in our hunting trips right there, man. Blessed in the country, in our hunting. I know, I figured somebody would get excited of that, but no, I guess I'm the only one. Bless you, shall you be in the country. Verse four, bless shall you be the fruit, bless shall you be the fruit of your body. Come on, ladies. Come on, childbearing. How many of you know children are a blessing of the Lord? It says, bless shall you be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, the offspring of your flocks. Verse five, bless shall you be in your basket, your kneading troughs. If I could say it this way, bless shall you be in your business. Come on, where's my business owners here today? Let me hear you if you're a business owner. Yeah. Amen, got a few business owners. Come on, you blessed shall you be. Verse six, blessed shall you be when, you, when you're coming in and blessed shall you be when you're going out. Woo, I like that. Verse seven, the Lord shall cause your enemies. Anybody got any enemies today? You cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before your face. That shall come out against you one way. Oh, but they're gonna flee how many ways? Seven ways. Verse eight, the Lord will command the, come on, everybody say it with me, the blessing on you in your storehouses and on all to which you set your hand to. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Do you believe today that the Lord wants you to be blessed? I believe that he does. To be blessed. But there's a couple things that I want to just look at here this morning. For us to successfully walk in the blessings of the Lord, we have to do, guess what? Our part. Come on, it takes us doing something. They are conditional. The blessings of God, everybody wants to walk in the blessings of God, right? Come on, how many want your marriage to be blessed? Yeah. Woohoo! Come on, how many want your family, your kids to be blessed? Yeah. Woohoo! Come on, how many all want your church to be blessed? Yeah, yeah come on, how many of you want, uh, what a, give me something else. How many of y'all want uh, your... Uh, your what? Your animal's blessed. Why not? <laughs> Mine's already bl really blessed because we're empty nesters, and so my animal gets really spoiled. But you know what I'm saying? God wants, I believe, his plan and his will for our life is to bless, not curse. Because the enemy's plan is to curse you. Yeah. Come on, Deuteronomy chapter 30 goes on and says, I put before you life, I put before you death, that God says. He said, you choose life, you're going to receive some blessings. You choose death, you're going to receive, he says, cursings. 
So we see this life of blessings contrasted with the life of cursings. And the thing is, it's all dependent upon our willingness to be obedient to the commands of God. Do the blessings of God automatically happen? I dare to say that the blessings of God are totally contingent upon my ability to be willing and to be obedient, to walk in his ways and to do what he asked me to do. Anybody else with me today? Amen. Amen. So I'll turn over to Matthew chapter 25, and I, this is where, where I really want to get into. In Matthew chapter 25, I love the chapter, the whole chapter, chapter 25. There's three different stories that are told in Matthew chapter 25. The first story we read about in Matthew chapter 25 is the parable of the ten bridesmaids, those that was waiting for the, the, the wedding party to show. The, the wedding party was waiting for the, the groom to show there. And basically the theme of that story is this, be ready, be prepared, because you don't know when he's coming. How many of y'all know we better be ready? We better be prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This world's getting crazier, right? Jesus may be coming sometime soon. I don't know when. Amen. But the second parable that's sandwiched in the middle there is the parable of the three servants. The theme of that is this, all could, but not all would. All could, but not all would. And the third and final story told in Matthew chapter 25 is the final judgment. And the theme of that is, did you live your life for others? We will be judged when we get to heaven. And Jesus will ask you, what did you do with your life? What did you do with what I gave you? Did you live your life for others? But I want to look at that middle story there, the story of the three servants. Matthew chapter 25 starts in verse 14. Matthew 25, 14, and I tell you, the Lord has had me in this parable time and time and time again. Starts out in verse 14, it says, for the kingdom of heaven, everybody say kingdom of heaven. So what we see here is Jesus beginning to share a principle of the kingdom of heaven, the way the kingdom of heaven functions. And I don't know about you, but I've realized early on that the way that God thinks is different than the way that I think. Anybody with me today? The way the kingdom of heaven operates is different than the way the kingdom of this world operates, all right? So he's getting ready to explain the way the kingdom of heaven operates, a principle of the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and he, if you can underline or circle this in your Bible or highlight it on your device, delivered his goods to them. Goes on verse 15. And to one he gave, how many? Five talents. To another, two talents. And to another, what? Highlight or underline or circle this. To each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Verse 16. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. Now, let me just summarize these next few verses because there's a lot of scriptures here. So the guy that got five, he made another five. The guy that got two, what did he do with it? He went and multiplied it again and he made another two. The guy that had the one, he was afraid what the master would do. He was afraid of his master. So it says he went and he hid the talent in the ground. So the master now comes back to take an accounting of what was given so if you look with me here, uh, starting in verse 20, uh, let me see where I want to start. Let, let, let me just jump down here. So the guy with the five says, hey, you gave me five. I got another five. The guy with the two, uh, let, me, let me back up. The guy that got the five got another five. Now look at verse 21, verse 21, verse 21. This is the reward of the guy with the five talents. Look at 21. And his Lord said to them, come on, read this with me. Well done, good and faithful. Come on, notice good and faithful servant. He says this, you are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over what? Many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So the guy with the two brings the other two. Look at verse 23. And the Lord said to him, come on, everybody with me. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Notice verse 21 and verse 23. You know what? They are identical. The reward for the five-talent guy, the reward for the two-talent guy is exact the same. You know what that tells me? It's not about how much you got. It's about what you're doing with what you have. Now, the guy with the one talent, he comes back and says, well, I was afraid, and so here's the talent you gave me. And you know what the master said? He didn't say, well done, good and faithful. He said, you wicked and you slothful servant. In fact, he, what he had now was taken away, and he said, give it to the guy with the five talents. Look at verse 29, verse 29. This is the theme of this, verse 29. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. So 
Let's see if I can unpack this just for the short time we have left in this service today. To live a blessed life, I believe that it's all about stewardship. Living a blessed life is all about stewardship, okay? Kind of reminds me, you know, Tammy and I, we just, we've got an investment property that we're working on and we had the grandkids over with us the other night. And so, you know, Hadley, nine years old, Caden's five years old. And we told them, hey, if you'll come over to the house, you know, and help us out, you know, we'll make some money. And of course, the grandkids, they're at this age now like, woo, because every time they're around us, give us some money, give us some money, give us some money, you know? And so I told them, I said, if you'll come over and help us around the house, you know, whatever it is, we'll give you some, make it worth your while. And uh, so we got over there, I'm pulling nails all through this wood floor, trying to get it cleaned up so we can put some flooring down. And, and I told Kate and Hadley, let's do this, do this. And I was really pleased because Hadley, she immediately says, Papa, if I help you out with this, will you give me 10 bucks? I'm like, wow, 10 bucks is all I got to pay her? I'm good. I says, sure I will, honey. Sure I will. And so about every five to 10 minutes, she said, Papa, when do I get my money? And I said, listen, I want you to know something. Your reward is going to be based upon the job that you do and how long you work it. And so I was really pleased. They worked for a good, I don't know, 30 minutes. You know, I, I didn't give them 10 bucks. I gave them 12 bucks. Like, woohoo, go Papa, right? <laughs> But the thing I want to see here, it's really all about stewardship. Stewardship. Everybody say stewardship. Stewardship. What is a steward? A steward, the original Greek language means this. It is the manager of a household or of household affairs. It's the manager. The manager. The dictionary definition of a steward is this. It is a person who manages the property or affairs for another entity. Okay? The New Living Translation defines it as one put in charge as a manager. So you may say, well, Pastor Brad, what are you saying here today? This is what I am saying. How many of y'all love God today? How many of y'all know God has everything and he owns everything? Anybody with me today? Amen. There's a phrase that I want to just leave with you today that I need you to remember, that if we really believe the kingdom of God principles, the saying is this, we are owners of nothing, but stewards of it all. He said again, we are owners of nothing but stewards of all. If we really believe in the kingdom of God, the way the kingdom of God works, Jesus tells the parable here in Matthew chapter 25, this, the master went away. Let me tell you, God is our master. And how many of y'all are glad God's our master today? Anybody with me here today? God is our master. And so we see here in the parable there that the master gave the servants goods. Goods, in other words, possessions. That word there, goods, he gave his goods. That actually means possession, something, something tangible. Whatever it is, gave them goods. Now, so when we look at, Jesus said, this is the way kingdom of God operates. God is the master. So everything that we have today, who does it belong to? Trick question. Easy how you answer that. Come on, who does it really belong to? If we really believe that everything is God's, then it all belongs to who? God's. It's all God's. So this is what stewardship is. See, this is why this is different from the way the world thinks. The way the world operates is not according to kingdom principles. There's a higher way, the kingdom of God. In other words, in the kingdom of God, everything belongs to God. In the kingdom of this world, everything that I can get is mine. In the kingdom of God, it's not about how much I can get, but it's about how much I can give. In the kingdom of the world, it's about how much I can give. Get, and I'm going to can everything that I get, and I'm going to sit in my can, and you can't have my can. Come on, you see the contrast in the two different kingdoms. The kingdom of God, kingdom of the world, which one do we live by? So if we're truly going to believe that we are the children of God, then everything that I have, it is God's. A lot of times when people come to World Harvest Church, they have this phraseology that they use, and I always kind of cringe when I hear it. Well, this is your church. It's your church. This is not my church. I have the opportunity to start this church. I have the opportunity to lead this church. This is not my church. This is God's church. I just simply a steward of it. I happen to be the lead pastor of this church. And let me tell you, you may say, well, you're the pastor. Let me tell you, that is not as sexy as it sounds. (laughs) 
Because I've got 500 crazy people, I mean 500 wonderful people that I have responsibility over. And you know what I've learned is people have problems. Not y'all, y'all on there, let's live. It was those nine o'clock service people that I'm talking about right now, you know. I mean, people got problems and it's like, ah! So you go back to the parable there. This is all about stewardship. How faithful are you with what you got in your hands right now? Again, the one guy got five, one guy got two, one guy got one talent. What determined what they got? Anybody remember the story? What was it determined? Why did one guy get five? Why did one guy get two? Why did one guy get one talent? Why? Did anybody remember the story? It was because, where did I hear? It was because of their ability. Now the master looked at him and said, dude, you're a five talent dude. Here's five. He looked at the guy that got two and he said, you know what? You can handle two. You got some ability there. He looked at the guy and said, hey, you can handle one. Here's one. Now, if he would have taken five talents, gave it to the one talent man, what would have been the result? He would have whittled it down to one. He would have lost it all. If he would have taken the five talent potential guy, gave him simply just one talent, guess what he would have made? He'd have made it five pretty quick. Because you go to the level of your capacity. There's a capacity that you have. Y'all have heard me share this before. When it comes to me, I, 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 this is not a good thing. I have had to deal with this all my life. Because there are many times I will look at other pastors, other preachers, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish I was as good as they are. And I've dealt with this image. I'm like, well, you know what? You know, there's always somebody better than me. You know what? I've had to come to the realization. It is a sin for me to compare what I've got to what somebody else has that I don't have possession of. It is a sin for me to say, well, I'm just a two-talent guy. God, you must not love me enough because I just got two and that guy's got five. I think too many times we get so wrapped up at what somebody else has that we don't realize I gotta be faithful with what I have in my hands now. See, the guy with the two-talent got the very same reward as the guy with the five-talent. See, this is what I've learned. You're a five-talent person. Guess what? You've got a lot more burden and responsibility to carry than me and my little two-talents. <laughs> Woo-hoo! I remember being a young preacher like, man, Lord God, give me a church of 5,000 people. And now I'm at the stage of life I'm in. I'm like, oh, thank God we've only got 500. Because, <laughs> man, you go, you're always dealing with at least five or six people every week I'm dealing with people that's in a crisis moment. You go to 5,000, guess what? You multiplied that by 10 times. Like, oh, dear Jesus, thank you, Lord, for what I got. <laughs> now, I'm not against God expanding and growing. In fact, I don't believe he's going to give me more than I can handle. So for me to look at whoever it may be, the greatest preacher, the greatest orator, the newest guy, and for me to say, man, I guess, God, you must not love me enough because I'm not like they are. I believe that's the sin of comparison. And that's wrong. And that's wrong. I need to value and appreciate what I have in my hands. Because it's not about what you don't have. It's about what you're doing with what you do have. Two types of stewards. Remember the good and the faithful. In other words, faithfulness determines how well you're doing. You're either faithful or you are unfaithful. And the reward, the reward for faithfulness, guess what? It's more. There's more. In fact, I think every one of us are in a test today of how well you're handling what's in your hands determines if you'll ever see what's in your heart. Sometimes we get so focused on what's on our heart that we disregard what's in our hands. Listen, I'll never see what's truly in my heart until I successfully steward what is in my hands right now. And here's another, just tag onto that. It's the phrase of this. If you don't use it, you're gonna lose it. So use it, use it. The peril, the five, the two, the one. The guy that didn't use it was the one. Hey, the one guy had the very much potential to get the very same reward the two guy, the five guy did, but he chose not to do anything with it. What are you doing with what you got? Elizabeth Dole said this many years ago. She said this, life is not just a few years to spend on self-indulgence and career advancement. It is a privilege, a responsibility. It is a stewardship to be lived according to a much higher calling. Second thought is this, stewardship is our responsibility. Come on, say, this is my responsibility. See, we are in a beautiful partnership with God. God delivers the goods to us. We're simply the stewards of what he gives us. 
I'm simply the steward of what God has given us here at World Harvest Church. I'm simply the steward of what I have in my possession, in my well-being, in my personal life. I'm simply the steward of that. So what am I going to do with what God has given me? I like in Luke chapter 12, kind of a parallel story to the chapter uh, 25 in Matthew that we read. And just look at the screens. Matthew chapter 12, verse 42 says this. The Lord replied, he said, a faithful, sensible servant. Come on, say that's me right now. Come on, tap your neighbor right quick and say, he's talking about me right now. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. Look at this, verse 43. If the master returns and finds that that servant has done a good job, Guess what? I like this. What did Jesus say? There will be a, come on, anybody like rewards? Yeah, verse 44, I tell you the truth. The master will put that servant in charge of all that he, jump down to verse 48, the last half of verse 48, look at this, says this. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, look at this, even more will be required. Mm. So stewardship is about my ability to respond to what God is asking me to do with what I have in my hands. Are you tracking with that? It's about faithfulness. Faithful. You know, as I look at across the sanctuary here today, just... So many of y'all, you've been faithful in so many little things, but I can't help, just there's one man that really stands out to me here today, and I'm gonna embarrass the socks off of him, but it's better to ask forgiveness than to ask for permission, right? But Scott Allen, you just bless me when you show up. I just, I know you've been through a lot of hell lately, and, and I just, I, and I know that God has, still has his hand on you beautifully. You've had, you, God has used you just so supernaturally over the years past in the school system, to speak into so many kids' lives and just, I love what he's done. And you know, you've been dealing with the COVID, this long deal with COVID. Uh, you bless me, so you, you're in this draw. I don't know how many of y'all follow Scott on Facebook, but uh, he's been drawing. He's in this season of drawing, right? In fact, do you have that picture? This is something that he drew, the, the roaring the lion of Judah, the tribe of Judah, the lion of Judah, overworld. I mean, that really blessed me. He, I've got that in my office there. But you know, Scott, I believe your best days are ahead of you. That's, you're not over. Now. And I just want you to know that I appreciate your faithfulness. Even when life has dealt you a blow, you've had time and time again, opportunity after opportunity again to say, I'm done, God. I've had too hard of a life, but you stuck with it. You stuck with it. Amen. In fact, I think you need a blessed. Hey, John, would you give him a hundred dollar bill real quick? Would you give, would you give Scott a hundred dollars? Man, well deserved. John, why was that so easy for you to give him that hundred dollar bill? Because it was your money. It was my money. And before service, you told me to give it away. I gave it to you to give away. <laughs> Scott deserved a blessing. How many of y'all? Come on, let's show Scott a little bit more of our love. <laughs> John was willingly able to give that $100 bill up because I gave it to him before service started and said, I want you to, in so many words, be a steward of this $100 bill for me. I'll tell you what to do with it later. So it's easy for him to give it away because guess what? It wasn't his. He simply, if I can put it in terms of the parable, he did what the master asked him to do. So God used John to bless Scott. And John, he could have just said, well, I need that $100 a whole lot worse than Scott needs it. John could have said, you know, what $100? What are you talking about? Did you, you didn't bless me with $100. I found this $100 bill, you know. <laughs> but he willingly gave it because he understood stewardship. Stewardship. And, of course, you know the reason why I gave it to him, because I entrusted John with my $100 bill that I knew that God wanted to use to bless somebody else. This is how the kingdom of God operates. It's stewardship. And stewarding is our responsibility. See, the big question is this. What are we doing with what we've been entrusted with? What are you doing? Your business is not for your own gain. Your business is for the kingdom of God. Now, you, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 so beautifully says, if we seek first the kingdom of God, he's going to take care of everything else. 
Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. You need your needs being met? You got needs being met? I'm sure if I was asked to John or Rebecca, do you have any needs in your life? They'd probably say, oh yeah. But seek first the kingdom of God, the way he does things, his righteousness. He'll take care of the rest of that. Do you see this principle of stewardship, how it operates in our lives? We get so greedy so many times with the thing that God gives us. This is mine. This is mine. Hands off. This is mine. Kind of like a kid. This is mine. Don't take away my candy. This is mine. But if we understand that we are owners of nothing, but we are stewards of it all, it helps release us because this is my third and final point that I want to leave us with. Being faithful with what you have produces miracles produces miracles. Every miracle that you read about in scripture, every miracle that's been experienced always started with something so small and insignificant. You think about Moses. I think about the story of him when he came up to the Red Sea after bringing the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. They hit the Red Sea and the children of Israel was like, oh my gosh, what did you bring us out here? You know, the, 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 the Egyptians come, they're getting ready to kill them all. And they're saying, Moses, you know, you brought us out here so that we'll die. You know, Moses looked up to heaven, God, what shall we do? What am I going to do? What did God say? He said, what's in your hand? What did he have in his hand? A staff, a stick, a stick. He said, strike the, strike the water. What happened? He took that stick, he struck the water, and what happened? Woo! A miracle took place. I think about young David. Showed up on a battlefield just to bring his brothers a, a, a DoorDash. <laughs> a grub hut. And he hears this giant out here, this Philistine guy, making fun of the children of Israel. Something rose up in David. Who does this guy think he is? Lo and behold, the rest of that story, what David stepped out on the battlefield with just a sling and a stone. King Saul tried to get him to step out there with something else that was not his. But David stepped out with just a sling. So in other words, David simply stepped out with what he knew and who he was. And a great miracle took place as David fell. When God directed that stone, just David died. I think of the great multitude that came out to hear Jesus one day to preach a powerful message. The disciples said, these people are getting hungry. Come on, you know, how many of y'all know? They, they probably weren't just hungry. They were hangry. I mean, they were like, you know, this, we're going to have a riot. Jesus turned to the disciples and says, well, you feed them then. I the said, we ain't got nothing. He said, what do you have? Well, they looked around. They, they had a happy meal. <laughs> you know, a kid's meal. That's that. But what did he, he took that little thing. He took what he had. Took what they had. And blessed it. Blessed it. The miracle of the loaves and fishes. If all they had was a piece of chewing gum, we would have read about the chewing gum miracle, how Jesus fed the multitude with chewing gum. Now that I'd like to see. But anyway, which is the principle of this? What was in their hands, God used it to bring about a miracle. Some of y'all are at a place in your life where you need a miracle. What is it that God wants to pour out? What is it? Let me rephrase that. What is it that God wants to use what's in your hand so he can pour out his blessings upon you. I think about, I just told this story last week when I was in Guyman at the church there at Victory Center that my dad, my, some of the earliest memories of my dad was he was a foreman of a ranch south of Perryton, Texas, 8,000 acre ranch. It was half farming and half cattle operation. And these are the early days that uh, my dad worked for a guy, his name was Pete Leslie, he actually lived at Alva, just, just a few miles from here up at Alva. My dad ran the ranch for him. And uh, so my dad was in this agreement with, his, with Pete for a set amount of money. I don't remember how much it was or anything. It was a set amount of money that he would get paid every pay period. Well, this one particular pay period, there was a lot more money that my dad received in his account than was agreed upon. Now, for some, you're thinking, woo, blessing. I got an accidental blessing. I found a $100 bill out in the parking lot. It's a blessing, woo hoo you know, or the, the, the cashier gave you back too much money. Oh, it's a blessing. Now, let me say this. My dad recognized that this was not a part of the agreement. So my dad calls up Pete up in Alva. So I think there's a mistake. Our agreement is that I make this amount of money, but you sent me this amount. And Pete, he kind of paused for a moment. He said, 
I was simply testing your integrity. See, my dad could have just put it in the bank, lived on it, and whoo, praise God, I got blessed. What was that? It was a test of his integrity, of stewardship. And Pete said this. He said, listen, I was simply just checking you, checking your integrity. He said, and because you were honest, he said, I want to send you and Margaret to Hawaii. So they sent him on a, I'm a little put out of that because he said just you and Margaret, not you and the kids. <laughs> so me, my brother, and my sister, we got to stay home and fight for two weeks while my mom and dad's in Hawaii. <laughs> but it's just simply a test of stewardship. I want you to stand to your feet with me here in the closing moment of this service today. What is it that the Lord is stirring in your heart right now? How do, we, how do we steward the mission that God has given us even as a church? What's our mission? Taking a real Jesus to a real world. Guess what? God is asking us all to participate in that mission. We got a testimony that we can give. We got Jesus to take to the world around us. Will you steward that? Will you steward it well? Oh, that let the leaders take care of that. Let so and so. No, listen, it's your mission. Come on, your testimony. Your testimony, right? This ministry. This is not Brad and Tammy's ministry, man. This is this is all of our ministries. What are we gonna do with that? What are we gonna do with this ministry? Come on, we've all been given goods from the master. I'll call them the, the T's, however you want to call them the T's. We, also, we call them the B's sometimes around here. But the T's, come on, how many of you know we've been given time? We've got time. Time. You'll never get back time that's spent. We've got to steward our time. We've got to steward our treasure. We talked about our treasure, our, our finances. Come on, our treasure. How about our talents? Come on, we've all got skill sets. Are you using them? Are you using them for the kingdom of God? I encourage you, if you're not active, doing something in the church, get active, do something. That's your talent, your skill set. Come on, we've got our temple. You know the body, the, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 says our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, if I'd known I was gonna live this long, I'd take a lot better care of myself. Come on, we gotta steward this body. Come on, what we put into this body, come on, it affects how we feel. We better steward this thing well, right? Come on, our testimony, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the words of our testimony. That's something to steward. We could talk it so much. Your marriage children to steward. What are we going to do with that? I want you to bow your head with me here as we close out our time together today. Heavenly Father, I thank you just for your principles. The kingdom of heaven, the way it operates. Sometimes it's hard to see in this so selfish world that we live in. So many are looking for self-gratification. But Lord God, we want to be about your kingdom, your kingdom business. Being a faithful steward. Lord, I know I've been there many times, Lord God. I've got my eyes so sometimes focused on what somebody else had that I wasn't faithfully taking care of what was in my hands. Lord, forgive us for the sin of comparison. Forgive us for that. Lord, help us to celebrate those that do have more. and Help us to be more faithful with what's in our hands right now. We want to be found faithful. And whatever that looks like, Lord, I thank you for entrusting us with your goods, with what you've given us. Lord, I know a message like this hits on hearts differently in different facets and different forms, but Lord, just speak to each heart right now what this looks like in their life, in the context with which they are living in right now. I want us to say this together. Say, Father God, My life is yours. Lord, help me to be more faithful with what I have in my hands right now. And let's let's say, Lord, thank you for everything that I have in my possession right now. Thank you for counting me worthy of that. And come on, let's say this. Say, Lord, and I recognize today that I'm an owner of none of it, simply a steward of it all. So, Lord, I'll do better at being faithful with what you've given me in my hands. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the word today. May we not quickly forget it. Whatever it is that you're stirring in each heart, may we be faithfully in that. In Jesus' name.
I'm going to ask prayer team if you'd come to the front at this time.